is online. YouTube is sending. YouTube is sending. YouTube is still sending and it's online. Let's go. Quarantine Hangs episode 11. What's up? Thanks to Mar for the Daily Riff. Daily Riff 50 fucking four. I didn't even realize he's been ripping them that hard for that long. This quarantine won't fucking end. What is up? It's Jer. How's it going, everybody? Another episode of Quarantine Hangs. We've got a great guest today. Gus Van Gogh is in the fucking house. I've tested his audio. I've tested his video. A lot of people stoked for him, and they should be. Not only did he do the very first Monster Truck official recording ever, He's also just like one of the raddest dudes and it's just, I feel like he's kind of an unsung hero of the Canadian music scene because he lives in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Um, and we're going to get to that later. So, um, what's up, Andrew? What's up, Ryan, Zach, Jamie, Brent, Chris, my homeboy, Chris Bastion. How's it fucking going? Everybody's in the house today. I feel good about this episode, man. I got a lot of stuff on deck here. We're going to hit it fast and we're going to hit it hard a weird 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 morning weird couple days honestly i feel like does everyone wake up in the morning and have to remember what the fucking situation is like you know that state you're in when you just wake up and you got to make sense of like am i who am i where am i what's going on every time i have that moment i'm thinking that the whole quarantine covid19 thing was a dream and i'm like that's just that can't be that can't be real and then i have to like compute my brain's like ding, 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 ding. nope it's real fuck and you have to like have that moment with yourself every morning. You're like, that's right. I can't fucking leave the house. This fucking blows. I have that every single morning. Um, also this week, something fucking super weird happened. Um, I was getting up uh, to grab a beer from the fridge. It was like one in the morning. Me and my girlfriend were watching Ozark. And I have a deta- I have a detached garage outside the house, long driveway with a detached garage. My house looks like a fucking like a meth lab from the street. It's super sketchy looking from the street. It's a tiny little house the size of my apartment, long ass driveway with like a fucking murder garage at the back. And I'm walking by the side door of the house to go to the fridge to get a beer, and I see the security light come on in my garage, and I hear like something thumping at the on the garage door. And I'm like, fucking, the raccoons are trying to get in my fucking garage early this year. Because they do. Now and then the raccoons and squirrels, they like to get in my fucking garage and rip my fucking garbage apart. So I'm like, goddamn raccoons are showing up in April. What the fuck? So I open the window and I go to look at the garage. And there's a full-size dude at my garage trying to lift the fucking garage open. And like, I had that like immediate like, oh, fuck. What's going on? I don't have any guns, okay? And I've never punched anyone in the face before, so I wasn't running outside to beat this guy. I open the door, I look outside, and I see, just to make sure that there is, in fact, a full-size, gigantic human being at my fucking garage door trying to break into my garage. So I yell at him. I go, hey, get the fuck out of here. And he looks over at me like he's annoyed. Like he's like, like it's his house, and I'm like telling him to go fuck himself, and it's his garage so i look at him and again i go hey get the fuck out of here and he just kind of turns around and starts slowly walking away like it's like a like it's like an annoyance that i'm like busting him busting into my fucking garage so he like walks down my long ass driveway which could fit like six cars and he gets down to the end of the driveway and i run around to the front of my house to look at the front window to make sure this guy's actually fucking off And I, you know, I got the little Venetian blind, so I peel them open and I look out the the window like a creeper and he's looking back at me like he's still bothered by the fact that I'm fucking screaming at him. So he fucking saunters off and I'm buzzing. It's like 1.30 in the morning. The adrenaline's fucking flowing. I'm like, I got to make a police report just in case, right? I got to fucking let the cops know what's going on. I don't call 911 because I'm not going to burden them with the emergency services. I call them up on their fucking on emergency line and I leave a police report. And even they were like, why didn't you fucking 
do more, you know? And I'm like, I don't know. Just, this guy didn't seem like he might, he might not have been all the way with it. And I didn't, I don't know. Anyways, that was my excitement for the week. Someone tried to break in my garage and I fucking screamed at them. I, maybe I should have done more. Maybe I should have tackled them and then I would have had a better story. But I'm not getting any fucking violent shit this week. I just want to be, leave my fucking hockey, my sweaty hockey gear alone. God damn it. Oh, lots of comments here. Got any good questions? Got any good comments? I'm hearing a Joe Rogan vibe. Joe Rogan doesn't have my goddamn energy, okay? He might be able to put me in a fucking reverse chokehold and talk about fucking science fiction or science uh, fiction and shit, but he doesn't got my energy, son. He doesn't got it. I like Joe Rogan. I'm not shitting him, by the way. If anything, if I, anybody, if there's anybody I'm biting on, um, if there's anybody I'm biting on, it, it's Chris D'Elia. Although, the new Chris D'Elia special, not feeling it. Unfortunately, what not feel I watch about half of it not feeling it. I don't know if you guys are I'm not digging it It's I, I mean, it's not bad. It's just like there's levels of comedy It's like there's all this comedy that's like decent which that is and then there's that next echelon the Bill Burr echelon the Patton Oswald echelon where it's like just pure hilarity the whole time and for me the new Chris D'Elia no pain is not in that category Um, Is that Fabio? I don't know how to pronounce that last name Fabio. Uh, anyways, we're going to just fucking play some new monster truck. Let me just say something about this before I spin like a little blurb of this new monster truck shit. Our, our, our producer, engineer Rats, is going to be fucking pissed that I played this. And I'm sorry, Rats, but people are going fucking crazy. This record's not going to be out for a while. Fuck. Fuck. Let's go. <laughs> That's all you get. I'm sorry. That's all you get. Fucking banger tune uh, called Golden Woman. Uh, that's the verse in the chorus, and that's all you get. Trust me, we want to play the whole fucking record for you. That's not even mixed yet, okay? That's just like a board mix, um, and there's still more. I know, I know I'm know. i teasing. I know I'm teasing, but I'm also not teasing. I'm also like, it's teasing me. Like You have to understand, we want to get this goddamn record out just like you want to hear it. I'm sorry. That's all you get for now. Uh, James Murphy, why you gotta fucking rub it in everyone's faces that you've heard it a few times? Get the fuck out of here, okay? I, it's as bad as me being like, hey, I got the fucking new MT, I'm gonna play you a fucking tiny little smidge of it. Sorry. Sorry, rats. I know it's not mixed yet. I know you're pissed that I played that, if you're even paying attention. Um. Oh, one more quick thing. Someone posted a video of the Calgary show that we played on the True Rockers tour, the one where our trailer broke down in the mountains and we were like four hours late showing up and the show didn't start till like midnight or later. I can't even remember. And a lot of people were fucking pissed. And I think it, it was one of those, it was really tough for us because we had to decide whether or not we wanted to go on with the show or cancel it. Starting at three hours late was, you know, going to be very inconvenient for a lot of people, but it was one of those things where like some people would want us to play at two in the morning if we showed up at fucking two in the morning. So we said, fuck it. And we, we grinded, gr paid so much money in towing fees and got to the show in Calgary. I know a lot of people, but half the people had left and were pissed that we were so late, which again was out of our control. And we did the show and this guy's post was, was basically thanking us for sticking it out and getting there and doing the show. Anyways, a great video, Dem Denim Danger, me fucking riffing a solo. And it was just one of those moments where it was like, I wonder if those people who left regret leaving and this isn't like to rub it in or anything, but this is just to like maybe adjust, help people understand and adjust their ways of thinking about what is actually important because now people are fucking freaking out and it's, you know, not for monster structure. I mean for anything, for like any live show, any fucking performance, anything you can do, you get out of your house, have a drink, enjoy, enjoy some time with your friends and some entertainment. And I'm wondering now if those people maybe think differently of the fact that they left um, early and missed out on the show 
either way, I'm not rubbing it in. It's just, it's, it's, it's something to think about moving forward when we get out of this bullshit as like, what is really important and are you being tired for work tomorrow? Not that important in the grand scheme of, you know, which was something that was a really great moment, not only for us, but for the people who stuck around and stuck the show out. And we fucking, I felt like we played a great show. Actually, we we cooped up in the van for like 12 hours that day. We got out, we ripped it and it was great. So anyways, kind of a cool memory. Thanks for sharing that. Um, I got your user handle written down here wrong. So I, you know who you are. Thank you for posting that. Um, it's been also a good week. Bear Taker released this week. My new side project with Theo. We dropped a four song EP that's available on all streaming platforms. And that was a lot of fucking fun to record. And you guys seem to be digging it for the most part. And thank you for streaming it and listening to it. Uh, uh, every, every little Spotify penny counts, believe it or not, in the long run. And another shout out about that recording goes out to Brandon Bliss organ player for the lovely monster truck he recorded that whole album with me uh, and i honestly i would not have been able to do it me and theo would have not been able to do it without his help he was absolutely critical in getting that record done and it was just uh i don't know it's what it's what friends are for and he did a great job um a lot of the people who do records don't get the um don't get the appreciation they deserve sometimes, especially from the fans, because it's all about the band usually when a record comes out and people love it. But I know there's a lot of people out there that do understand the value of the engineer and the producer. And that's what is going on today with today's episode is who we got on the show. Gus Van Gogh did the first self-titled uh, Monster Truck EP, uh, but he's also done tons and tons and tons of other bands. Um, he did the first Priestess record, which is a fucking smasher. Um, he's worked with the Arkells. Um, he's just done... a just a ton of great Canadian records and also international records he recorded the lazies first full length. Um, and he's got a lot of great input. He's a very creative guy and, uh, he's very uh, kind of ahead of the curve, so to speak when it comes to trends and, uh, production and just the way of kind of moving forward with creativity. So we're going to get him on in a second here. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Yeah. Let's just go to the interview here. I'm going to call him up. He's, we're calling him up a little touch early, so I hope he's ready. Um, I don't really have any other videos today or any funny commercials or anything. I wanted to keep it nice and tight, and uh, we'll get right to the interview here. Okay. Get it. Let's get him going here. Hopefully he's ready. 100 messages today already. All right. Nick from Sticks and Stones says Bear Taker is killer. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Sticks and Stones is a good little upcoming band you guys should check out. Oh, I hope he's ready. He's like, God damn it, he's calling me early. Yeah, Natalie wants to see Brando on the on the uh on the show. We're definitely gonna get Brando in here. It's kinda hard. He doesn't have great internet. Oh, he didn't answer. What a fucking guy. I will call him again in a second. Let's talk about something else here that's been going down is uh, Marv is going to be doing Total Riff Meltdown on Wednesdays at 6 p.m. where he is going to go through some of the daily riffs that he does and also bring other people into the stream and hear their riffs and talk about riffs and riff and riff and guitars and riffs. So I'm going to probably pop in there next week. Um, we'll be having a bunch of people probably come in and show us their you know guitars and rigs and setups and everything and uh yeah, it's just basically Total Riff Meltdown, Wednesdays at 6 p.m. on the I Love Monster Truck Instagram, um, hosted by Marv, and uh, you know I'll be making a little bit of appearance. I'll be making a little bit of an appearance in there now and then too. So, let's give let's give him a call. Let's give uh, let's give him a call again and see if he can get get him in here, get him to answer his goddamn phone. Come on, Gus. Yes. Hey. Sorry, I, I I'm a little early. I know. Oh, it's all good. Yeah. Oh, good. Your, <laughs> the video is coming in even better this time. So there we go. All right. Perfect. Yeah. So you're my second interview from New York City. Really? Yeah. This in the last like two weeks. And so I got to ask how you're doing, how things are going over there, because I know, I know it's, uh, it's, it's, it seems to be rougher there than in other places. It's definitely, uh, feeling a little post-apocalyptic walking around the streets. Um, you know, and uh, obviously the news is a constant barrage of insanity. Um, and then you have to, you know, we have to temper how much news you watch because like, it could just bring you down. Uh, that's, but, what you know, I, you have to, that's what I tell yeah. people too. You gotta chill but you have shit. to, 
but you got to still stay informed, you know? So, uh, I'm doing like what everybody else is doing and just like sort of picking and choosing my times, picking and choosing who I have to listen to. <laughs> and, which is, uh, you know, I guess a luxury and, uh, of, of living in these times that to be able to pick and choose the news you want to hear. Yeah. But, uh, but at the same time, you know, trying to like, uh, decipher what's true and what's not, but like, walking the streets is it's it's kind of freaky you know like the hustle and bustle of new york city is definitely not happening yeah uh that's gotta be so weird for new yorkers it's bizarre as hell and uh you know uh, yeah everything being shut down it's it's crazy and but this is a this is a town that thrives off of public transportation yeah that's like that's gone yeah uh it's a it's it's we're all packed in. The, the reason why it's so fucked up here is that it's all everyone's so packed in in, in such a dense yeah. small geographic area with like basically the population of canada in one city yeah con- compressed into like you know like four square miles yeah it's crazy so it's, uh, that was that was see, honestly that was the thing since i that's not my vibe and that was right. the thing when i was there doing the record was that it it throws me off, man. It's too many people too tight in. Like the pizza's yeah. great and the coffee's great, but like holy <laughs> shit, dude. Like I can't I can't couldn't do it. I could not do it. Uh, I can't do New York and I can't do LA. Like I can't do really? either. No, I can't do either, man. I want just like a log cabin in the middle of fucking nowhere where people can't break yeah. into my garage. That's, you see, uh, I, I thrive off of the the hustle and bustle. Like, I know. I need, no, uh, I know. Like, I know. Like, I if I don't if I don't it's like as soon as I get into anywhere, I'm like, "Where's the nearest third wave coffee shop?" Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I need my hipster coffee. Yeah, I need my hipster I, coffee too, but I make it myself. That's, right, right. There's that. There's that. So, um, it's let's, two different philosophies. I know. Well, let's talk about this then, because uh, I'm talking about being in in New York City, which at the time for us was a really exciting moment in the band's career because it, we were making our first legitimate record. Right. And me and you had basically had a, a phone conversation that had sold, I think, both of us on the idea of us coming there to do the record, which is yeah. really exciting. And so basically, like what I remember about it, and I'm going to just give my little two cents here and then you can fill me in on the on the holes in my memory because my memory sucks. But what I what I do <laughs> me too yeah okay well, well we'll fill each other's gaps in. But I do <laughs> I do remember being super gung ho but wanting to do it live off the floor. Yeah, and I remember you were very, very hesitant to agree to that, and I had to really lean on you on the phone to agree yeah. to do that. And then when we got there, the, basically the agreement that I remember we came to was that I wanted to do it live off the floor. I was checking with you to see if you had the te- technical capability to do it live yeah. off the floor because it's a small studio. Yeah, and you had basically agreed to do it on the condition that if it started going fucking south. Like if we got into like five, 10, 20 takes and it wasn't working that you were yeah. allowed to pull the plug on it and yeah. that we would reset and do things piece by piece. Like we, like, like we always do now or like super, you, super fair thing to ask we, for. Exactly. And the beautiful part we packed up into, damn, we packed up into just Steve's little tiny car. It was this <laughs> little, like two door. And we cr- really, yeah, well, we were, because we had, we had tons of gear. We used video. all your gear and yeah, we yeah. crammed into this little two door and we blasted down to Brooklyn and we set up the gear that we did have. And I think we got about like three takes into running as like a yeah. warm up, as like a, this is the first song we're going to track. And I think you look, I was in the control room with you and the rest of the guys yeah. were all spread out amongst the studio. And you looked over at me and you were like, this is going to work. Yeah, and yeah. I was like, I fucking knew it was going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and it was just like it was such a fun thing we ended up getting i know we ended up getting the all four songs done in a day and a half right and that's just like my whole that's like the you know when you have all these like key, minus minus the vocals yeah minus vocals and we dubbed guitars and right. we mixed and you know we did we did uh actually did we mix or did you mix when we left? I, I I mixed after you left, but we no, we kept the guitars that you played. Oh, I know that, but we dubbed. Oh, yeah. I dubbed like solos oh, on and I, stuff. I solo extra yeah. stuff, like yeah. extra stuff, right, right. But right. anyways, that's the yeah. those are my like I have like those four keystone memories yeah, yeah, about yeah, the yeah. whole thing, and I'm just wondering like what do you remember about that session? Because we were green like as a, as as the band Monster Truck, like we'd been in other bands, but you know, tell I, me, tell I, me. My my reaction to our our conversation was that like I wasn't super into the idea of recording live because like but i got what you were trying to go for yeah and 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 what you were in a mode that you were reacting to past bad experiences yep 
And like, I never like going forward on an artistic venture, like with, with something being based on fear. And, <laughs> and so, so I, I like to be like, based on like, you know, I try to base things on like knowledge and experience and, you know, and, and being like just a reaction to something bad is usually a bad way to go. Sure. And I was trying to tell you that, but at the same time, I'm like, okay, I'm going to use this energy and see also, we don't, we rarely record a uh, full band live off the floor in our studio. Like you said, it's a, it's a relatively small studio. So it's like, it, I, I wasn't super into it, but the other main reason was that like, with a band like you guys, in my mind, it, it was all, it, it's like ACDC or something. It's all about like how tight and how in tune the band <laughs> in is. In tune, fucking. Yeah. And, and so it, like, like ACDC, the reason those guitars sound so fucking amazing in stereo and headphones and like two speakers, one guy on the left, one guy on the right. And it sounds massive, those guitars. And, and, they're, and it's not because they're like super distorted. Like they're not actually that distorted no. ACDC guitars. I learned they're like that. relatively clean. It's just that like they're perfectly in tune. Yeah, they're to perfectly. Them. And like and all you know, it's like and the the voicings of the guitars are, are just so perfectly to like have everything chime and it just like ends up sounding massive, you know. And uh, a lot of that is tuning and tightness which ACDC obviously were the kings of and why they are still revered as one of the best bands to this day. And, uh, and in my mind, like a band like yours, like should be like on par with that. And yeah. that that's the, that's the level to strive for. Yeah. And I felt like with a, li a live off the floor thing would have been more of like a retro seventies, like kind of like shtick yeah. or like, it was like a, like a cute move. Like, okay, they did it live. Yeah. So, you, so you can you, say like, that in the band bio. But also, like it, it'll, you could, you could get away with more. Like, oh, it's a little untight and a little rough around the edges. But they played it live. That's why, you know. Yeah. So, and I, and I figured, like, okay, well, I'm not going to get an insane sounding final product because it, it'll be slightly out of tune. It's slightly untight, but it'll be, uh, it'll maybe have this other thing, which is like maybe some kind of live energy or yeah. well, that's, uh, which is, that's the, that was the thing that you were hoping for. That was, was the, the live energy. Yeah. And that was the thing I was hoping for, but that was also the thing we graduated from the idealistic vision of that. And then eventually morphed it into the idea of the Brownie P, which we did with rats where we, right. we played it live with Steve, but we redubbed everything. We, right. you know, if we were able to keep bass parts, we keep the bass. Maybe if there was right, a really right. good guitar or magic moment, we'd keep that's, it. That's, that's the, idea. the more standard that's the, way to do the it. The smart, yeah. the smart way. The, uh, <laughs> the I think what, you, you, the way we did it together was like a stepping stone to that. And you, I think you needed to shake things up. And I and I was glad to be a part of it. Yeah, it was. And it we, was crazy I, and fun. I, yeah, it was crazy. I learned stuff from it. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, I I I wish that we can. You know, I, I wished that we could have done more songs in the way I wanted to do yeah, it. Yeah, I know. You know, I, know. I, dude, I, think, like, I still, I still think about that and I still hope that one day, I still hope <laughs> oh, that one day. I'm we, sure, I'm sure we'll do something. I'm, I'm certain of it. So that's, it, we'll, <laughs> we'll save that. We'll save that for an epi the next episode. But, uh, yeah, yeah, there you go. So, so I wanted to get that out of the way, but let's go back to, um, kind of how you got started. Cause, cause you, uh, as young as you look, you've been around the block. Yeah. And so were you born in Montreal? Or did you move to Montreal? Weirdly, I was born in Argentina. Holy fuck. I didn't see I didn't yeah, even know yeah, that. Yeah. yeah, I was born in Argentina of Italian parents. Yeah. Uh so lots of like international like stuff. And so uh, I still speak Spanish to my parents to this day. Wow. And we were and I, I speak Italian to my whole rest of the family. Cool. And uh and we moved to, to uh Montreal. So yeah, that's the Montreal thing. Yeah. We moved to Montreal. So when I was really young, I, I spent my childhood in Montreal. And then uh, I, I was, my first band uh, was a Montreal band when I was in my early 20s. And then uh, when that band broke up, I was kind of like, what do I do with my life? I was in my mid 20s and I just decided, fuck this, I'm going to try something totally crazy. And with like $400 in my pocket, I, I moved to this apartment. I know. And that was, I mean, I, through my little progression of questions here, you kind of, you, you skipped over the me, mom and Morgan Tollers part right. of it which was a band that you were in um that had just like an absolute cult following in montreal 
to the point of where you were basically forced to go and do a reunion show in 99 and had over 10,000 <laughs> people at it basically it was yeah, just yeah. madness um, so it must have been like a, it must have been a real leap of faith then, for, you know, to go from where you were comfortable, where you knew, where you were comfortable create uh, creatively, and then yeah. make the leap um, to Brooklyn. Which is again just to point out to anyone you know that doesn't really fully understand this, Gus moved to Williamsburg about ten years before it was cool, <laughs> and and in doing so, you really set up shop in a spot that became a mecca for artists, um, musicians. Yeah creativity all you know amazing coffee amazing pizza just general coolness all around yeah um and so just tell me a little bit about that because i know like you said you had you know almost no money you were getting you through got yeah, on in a van it was a weird it was a weird situation but we're like when the band broke up me me and the another guy in the band this guy bix who actually is an amazing uh, artist manager now he manages has managed all sorts of acts like Colorado and pup and uh always and all these bands he's an amazing manager he and i were in my our first band together me mom and morgenthaler in montreal and then when that band broke up we were just like well well let's keep playing music together and we started writing and stuff and we we're like do we want to stay in montreal and i was like well maybe we move to toronto like you know even bigger city let's try something crazy but we had both been obsessed with new york since our you know teenage years and uh love new york bands and love woody allen movies and we loved like we just were enamored with new york yeah and and we used to come here all the time even in our with our band we used to book shows we played cbgb's with me mom and morgan taller wow and i remember like one day like being in new york and going like like I i'm gonna live here like and i was just certain of it i just it was just there was there was the only thing i knew it's like I, one day i'm gonna live here i've heard so many new yorkers say that like yeah. they just got there, they got the vibe and they were like, this is where I need to be. It's, it's a kind of weird city that has a certain calling. Uh, like it's, it's, I don't like to be mes metaphysical. I'm not very into spirituality or anything, but there's a, there's a definitely, there's an, a draw to New York. It has a, it has a vibe that's yeah. tangible. And the minute you land here, you get in the middle of like, you know, anywhere here, like union square and you look around, you're, uh, there's a vibe and, it called to me immediately, even when I was like 20, 19, when I first came here. And uh, long story short, uh, I'm going to like uh, when, with my band, we when we we got the second band together, this band called Smitty's, me and Bix, we uh, we were like told all the guys in the band, just so you know, if you join this band, there's going to be a date where we're all going to move to New York. <laughs> and so oh. and so we only only had guys that joined the band that were ready to make that move. And then weirdly, we had a friend that this very apartment opened up and, uh, and they, this was in the nineties, mind you, you know, so it's a, a while ago, yeah. uh, they, uh, this apartment opened up and they're like, Hey, uh, we're moving out of our apartment. You want to just take over the lease? And I was like, yes. Yeah. And then, uh, a few, like a few weeks later, I packed up all our stuff, our meager belongings and moved here, uh, you know. And uh, and then started the band, and then you know. Did everyone come that, though? You you made the agreement with all the band members to come, and they all came. They all came. Okay. We all moved into this apartment, and uh, we all like. I was two guys to one room. We were paying like two hundred and fifty bucks a piece. <laughs> to, you know, it was like this was a rat infested shithole. Uh, like the neighborhood was like you know there was like you know you know burning tires in like oil drums like you know straight like out of like a door. double dragon video game just like total oh, fucking I, disarray. I really i was i felt like i was getting coming into like some mad max shit when i moved here yeah and uh yeah i mean i couldn't even go into my kitchen there was literally rats and like it was it was terrible and uh you know but and we had no money and it was like it was the craziest thing i ever did in my life but you know slowly but surely like made it nicer and nicer and nicer and like that band evolved and some guys left the band and some we had new york guys that joined the band and you know at around in around, in around 2000 that band broke up but i had already started my life as a producer as a secondary job kind of thing as a sort of like new way of looking at my my musical career yeah as, as a producer and uh and so i I, I transitioned well enough, like from 
being a guy in a band to being a guy producing bands. And, uh, and eventually all the guys moved out of this apartment, got married, my wife moved in and then we re really took care of the apartment and made it really like nice and yeah. never moved out. Yeah. yeah. Well, that's well, so going there with it, with the transition from that, you know, yeah. uh, tell me about meeting your partner Warner in the production yeah. game. How's he, first of all, how's he doing? And tell me about meeting him. He's doing, he's doing fine. We're, we're both isolating and we're both like taking uh, tag team turns at the studio. Like, so today I'm not there obviously. Yeah. And he's there mixing something and we're, we're doing one day off one day on. Um, we're like, uh, I, I met Warner when we, I was in my band Smitty's and playing New York, the New York scene. And, uh, he was in a, like a similar minded band called Vaporhead. Okay. And, uh, and he was like the guitar player, uh, uh, and I was the lead singer of my band. He was the guitar player of his band. He was the hot and shit guitar player. He, he was, was the hot <laughs> shit. He, he is an amazing <laughs> guitar player and backup singing. Yeah. And, uh, and we would, uh, we would always be put on the same bills somehow, you know, that's yep. not how that ha sort of happens. Yep. And, uh, cause we sort of both sort of sounded like cheap trick meets the clash with a little bit of pop punk and a little bit of this and that. So, uh, we, we just like, joined this uh this group of bands and then i remember just shooting the shit with him and he was like yeah i have a little studio if you want to ever come check it out and Perfect. i checked it out and then he had this crazy thing called pro tools <laughs> that that like you can record onto the onto the computer and i remember i remember going to the studio and he was showing me stuff and first of all this is super important was like he played me stuff that he had been working on and it was the first time that I had listened to somebody that I knew in a, in a recording studio and I heard it and it sounded like all my favorite albums oh, already. Wow. Like it was like slamming out of the speakers and it sounded like, you know, Foo Fighters at the time or whatever, Radiohead. And, you know, just like it sounded world class. Whereas a lot of the guys that I had been working with before that, it always just kind of sounded a little lame or a little yeah. like local bandish. Yeah. And, and I was trying to come up as a producer myself and learn the ropes. And I, I, I was always like struggling with like, why is it that some people, their productions and their mixes just sound okay. And like, but all my favorite albums sound amazing. What mm. is that yeah. next level? Like, how do you retain that? And when I met Warner, I was like, oh, you know what you're doing. <laughs> so I was like immediately attached myself yeah. to him. That's how you and, do uh, it. And he, and he got, you know, we both had personality traits that match. Like he, he was not a go-getter and trying to get gigs into the studio. You know, I was more of a people person, more of a talker, more of a hanger out with bands. And, yeah. and I would be like, I was like, Warner, if I bring in bands, you want to do stuff together? And he was just like, yeah. And it just around, became what year is this? around what year is this? It's around 2001, 2002. Wow. And then, uh, the first thing that we officially produced together was, uh, was the stills. Yeah. And, and you basically uh, so did all the records from that point on basically, right? We, we did all, all the stills records yeah. from that point yeah. on. And, uh, you know, that our first record together was the first stills record. And that record sold like 250,000 albums and was signed to Atlantic in the U S worldwide. <laughs> and like, we went to Japan and everywhere all over the world. And like, it was like a huge worldwide phenomenon and uh and that was our first thing together so wow. we were like hey you want to just keep working together and so every like from priestess and Colorado, and then all the bands after that like we've just kept working together and are still working together to this day that's amazing i yeah. I, I love how you guys just fucking knock it out of the park on the first try fuck you <laughs> <laughs> um let's talk yeah. let's talk about the, uh, priestess because one of the things that i learned when i got to the studio ab about you doing that priestess record and i won't divulge the secret but you had a very interesting uh, way of getting the guitar sound, which took you a fucking long ass time to sort out um, because you, you know, knowing that they're a guitar driven band, you really needed to get the guitars right, which, you know, yeah, we've, yeah, we, yeah. I've done it before. <laughs> I've got it down to a science now where I can like on the new monster truck record, we had the guitar sound up in like 45 minutes, but like right, the, right, there right. have been times where I'm there for days, just like yeah, this yeah, cab yeah. and that cab and this guitar and whatever. And so basically the secret sauce that you, were, you worked on the priestess record got me thinking about how sometimes in the studio you get so frustrated that you have to break your own rules. You yeah. have to kind of like adapt to a situation where nothing that you know 
from the past is working <laughs> yeah. and you have to adapt to it by yeah. basically down is up, up is down. Yeah. So besides the priestess guitars, which if you want to go into that, you, you sh- surely yeah. you can, but uh, can you think of another good example of a time when you really sat down and you were like, fuck, I've got to tear everything down that I know and just start trying shit that doesn't make any sense. I literally have to do that daily. Wow. I, I like, the day you stop learning as a producer is the day that you become an old fart. And uh, I've, I've met many, many producers and uh, engineers and mixers that are old farts that like... I've met a few. S- respect to everyone doing their thing. Everybody's, yeah. got their, everybody's got their gig and that's all cool. And I, I don't like dissing people, but like what I mean by old farts is when you stop learning yeah, stop and learning. stop progressing sure. and stop wanting to learn. Yeah. Like... The, the the worst the worst thing about pr- most producers that I've met that, that that fall into these categories is is that is when they're the know it all producer. I hate that so much, and it's so prevalent in this industry. It is the engineer producers that know it all yeah. for some reason because yeah. they get so used to working with uh, bands that are doing their first or second records that they they get into this like teacher student mode with their artists. And, uh, like it, it just becomes this thing where you're like, Oh no, you always have to do this. And this always is better when you do this yeah. in this order. Yeah, yeah. And like, I always hated that when I was in a band yeah. and when I first started producing, I, w- I, I remember mentally going like, never, like, I will never do that. Yeah. Like I, I, like I'm there because no one ever helped me when I was a dude in a band trying to go like, well, how come like, I want to get a guitar tone like that. And they're like, Oh, that sounds shitty. And I'm like, okay and i'm like no it doesn't i want that like yeah and i just didn't understand why fucking dudes would just like talk down to me because i was doing in a band and i promised never to do that and well, that, then uh honestly that was one of the things that really drew me to your vibe was being in the studio and watching the way that you would work through th- certain ideas and how kind of it, it really always did feel like anything was possible anything is doable let's try yeah. it let's let's try this let's try that let's just try everything yeah. and i i really dug that um i mean the, the my mentor you know i didn't remember him but my mentor was george martin from the producer of the beatles yeah and reading all about him and the Beatles career and everything. And like at the beginning, he was the know-it-all producer telling them, no, you can't do this. You can't do that, which was, which was great. And the early, I love the early Beatles stuff, but when they really started to flourish artistically as a band with, you know, like revolver era and all that rubber soul and all onwards, it's like when, when, you know, George Martin started realizing, oh, these cats have seriously cool ideas and their ideas are weird and go against the rules, but also produce hits. And so you can the, have both. Yeah. And so and uh, so they were trying, like, let's bring in a harpsichord or like, let's bring in like, let's <laughs> put the tape backwards. And, you know, and, and he would be like at first, like, well, that's against the rules. But then suddenly they would still have hits and yeah. they would still be amazing songs. And when he started to like let the, you know, let, give them a more rope to play with. And uh, that's when the, their stuff became really amazing. I, I never forgot that. And I was like, I will always give my artists the benefit of the doubt. You know, I, I, I reserve my right to put my foot down occasionally. Yeah. But, but everyone I work with knows that I do that only when I have to. And so they, and there's never an argument when I'm like, when I'm like, no, no, we're not going to do that. They're yeah. like, okay, cool. Yeah. Like Gus so rarely says no, that <laughs> when I do, it means something. You well, know what I mean? Well, you don't know where the line is unless you go over it. Like right. you can always think the line is somewhere, but unless you actually cross yeah. over and fuck up, you never know or if, where or that for, is. Or for a dude in a band has a crazy idea. I'll be like, let's give it a college try for a minute. You mm-hmm. know, they're like, and then like shit goes on for a while. And then when I, I start to, I, I think I got a pretty good sense of like, this is going nowhere. I'm like, okay, let's try this, you know? And then I, I interject, but like, let them feel like they had a moment, you know? Yeah. So there's that, you know, the other thing about learning too, is like the rules are, are hard. Like, I, you know, when you growing up in the nineties recording, like the only bass that you can possibly ever record was a P bass. And it had to, and it had to be going through an SVT. Cap. You, I feel like you were on this tip when we got, I there. was on that trip. Yeah. I was on that trip. Yeah. And like, there's rules that like, that, that you have to, and like I said, every day I'm learning and I, every day I'm struggling with breaking my own rules. And that's a perfect example. When I met you, I was probably still on the train. of you the were. Only, 
The only you bass that it, sounds good is a P bass. Well, that and I remember you had a moment with the Junction where they were still trying to play bass with the fingers, and it's a rock band, and you're like, you're gonna have to get a pick, and you're gonna have to okay. get a pick now. You still. I I still do not like bass with fingers. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do I. Neither do I, dude. No, it's that's a, a that's a personal taste thing. It's that, not a rule. Okay. But. Well, let's talk I, about. I, I, yeah, let's, let, let, let's talk about this for a second, because one of the things that goes hand in hand with breaking your own rules is following your gut, and yeah. I believe that that is a skill that not only can come naturally, and some people just are naturally gifted at their ability to tap into their gut instinct and use it to be for all kinds of positive and successful results, but also that it's something you can practice and something that you have to work on as you get older you start to learn about listening to that little voice inside you that does know the answer you just can't cloud it with all the other external little things that get in the way that can confuse you from following your gut instinct what's telling you what the right guitar to play is what the right sound is what the right note is what the right person to be around is and I'm just, I, I kind of just maybe just if you could speak to that and if there's the times where you've maybe maybe um, been in a great spot where your everything you, you every, your gut instinct is just working on over overdrive and then other times where maybe you've lost touch with it a little bit and like it's caused you to either go down the wrong path or maybe not make the the right decisions in the right moments god it's a tough question i i honestly i don't know because like i i think i feel like i follow my gut all the time uh you know there are times there are times when i don't I don't feel like I'm in touch with my gut. I know what you're saying. Yeah, like you, some, uh, there, there's been moments in monster truck where it's happened where I, yeah. like, you know, we're in the, in, in the inception in the band, I knew exactly what we should yeah. sound like, what we should do, how we should do it. And then as things went on and, and you go on tour for months at a time and your brain gets melted or you, yeah. you know, you get the wrong advice and, but it seems like the right advice at the time and you know, labels and marketing yeah. and social media. Yeah. And it's like, you start to deviate from the original idea, which is something that we kind of did for a moment there. And we've kind of circled back around on it now and understood yeah. where we're coming from. Yeah. Um, and it's just, uh, I mean, I, I'm usually the guy that's hired to get a band out of that rut. Yeah. Well, that's, uh, that's yeah. kind of your job sometimes. Yeah. So like a, a lot of times a band will be like, you know, we kind of like, like, you know, this and we like that. And it's like, we, we're writing some songs that are going in this direction and then some songs that are going in that direction. I, we don't know anymore, you know, like what songs do you like? And what, you know, like here, we'll play you everything. And so, sometimes artists are generally really often coming to me to help guide or, or like, or, or, or maybe find, trim away, find the, essence. Find, find the essence that's necessary. So I literally have to follow my gut so much every day that I, don't even know what not following my gut is. Anymore. See, so there's the fucking perfect answer. You could come out. You could have just come out like a boss and just been like, "Yo, I follow my gut all the time. That's how I. <laughs> that's how I do uh, it." <laughs> but it's true. This is true. But uh, at the same time, there are moments of doubt, and oh, yeah. uh, that's uh, that's something that's for real for everybody. You know, just that, like going that like, leads into that leads into my next question though, which is, yeah. I, is someone is, before we get to that though, people are asking sure. what you're drinking. What's in oh, the cup? This, <laughs> this is yerba mate, Argentinian tea. <laughs> Holy <You> fuck. <laughs> I'm from Argentina, like I said. So you have this like, this is like the most hipster thing I do in my life. Dude, it sounds like it's it. Like, it's like, it's got this like crazy tea that looks like weed. Okay. And you got this like metal straw that has a, has a uh, mesh tip and then you suck it back and it holds back the, the bits. And uh, and holds back the bits, and then you have a hot tea, and uh, it's tons of caffeine. And what a fucking what a boss! This is why I got you on. I just, I knew this was a good idea. So going back to that question, let me let's talk about that. When in the moments where you may be doubting yourself, ha can you think of a record that you've recorded where you weren't a hundred percent like you finished it, and you were like ah like it was good, it's good or whatever, but like I feel like we could have done so much more, and then. After a year or two has passed, you maybe don't pay attention to it, don't listen to it, obviously, because you haven't listened to it every day for a month or whatever. You come back yeah. to it and you're like, what, what the fuck was I on? That record's amazing. Or like it turned out, <laughs> it, it turned out, you know what I mean? Because you have that, yeah, when, yeah, you, yeah. when you get that space, you get the perspective. And then when you yeah. get the perspective, you can see things for what they really are. And I'm just wondering if you can think of a specific album where that happened to you. Well, there, there, there are albums that were rife with strife. Uh... <laughs> which is uh would be a cool title for a memoir. Yeah. Uh 
there are albums that I've done that are were rife with strife, and I and I tend to not listen to those anymore once they're done. Really, uh, they just they're just they're t- it's too many bad memories. Not not nothing that's ever been like yeah, insanely no. bad. I've had great relationship with everybody I've worked with, but you know there were some albums that were more difficult than others. And then when you listen, I listen back to them, I hear the strife in it. Uh. I don't know if it's like my perspective because I was there, but I listen to it, I'm like, that was a weird call. Like, <laughs> oh, that's a weird like you know. Or, or, or sometimes it's just like, well, there's like maybe five good songs on that record. And if I, if I was like, you know, sometimes a train is a rolling and you can't stop it. There has been many an album that I have put stopped dead in their tracks because the, I, I just felt the band didn't have all the, the album written yet. And uh, we've been right in the middle of a corner. I'd be like, we don't have all the songs. Let's put a stop on this. Everybody wow. go home. And like everyone's like looking at me like this, and it's happened more than once. Uh, you know, I have to call the label and go like, you know, They're I could not, spend the, the next, I could spend the next two three weeks with with this band and and spend your money and then call it a day. But I think it'd be a waste of your money. Wow. Uh, and, and they agree in general. Yeah. And some most of the time the bands are like, yeah, <laughs> they're you know what you know what that is though. That's them thinking Gus can fix this. They hear the de- <laughs> they hear the demos, right. and then right. and they're like they're like, well, it's not really an album yet, but Gus will fix and, it. <laughs> and I tr- and sometimes I try, and sometimes you do polish a turd to the point where it's like awesome. Yeah, and then the, and sometimes you you like find the right hook in a, in a song that's a little murky, and then that draws all the inspiration, and every all the parts click in, and then you end up having an amazing song. But you need a body of work to make a really great album. You know, I mean, obviously we sound like OK Boomer when you talk about an album nowadays, but it's like back in the day when I started, albums used to matter. They still uh, do, man. I fucking refuse to believe that they're not important to people because at the end of the day, holy shit, when there is an album that you like, I have a couple of my favorite albums, especially recently where I won't sit down to listen to a song off of it. If I'm going to listen to that record, I'm listening to the whole fucking record and I'm going to designate some time to like, or I have some time to designate and I want to listen to the whole thing. And I refuse to believe that this is like a thing that's becoming extinct. It's not fucking happening. (laughs) Okay. Boomer. (laughs) (laughs) You You can't say that to me. (laughs) You can't say that to me. I agree. No, I agree. I, I, firmly come from the world of uh of albums i mean like my career was based on it weirdly my career in the past like two 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 and a half years has, has like become where i'm doing less albums yeah everyone wants to do like three songs S- singles run, ep and then, yeah. like ep a single you know and i've been doing so many of those i don't even remember like the last time i got just hired to do an entire record i've i've done entire records but they've been in like three or four chunks of three records uh, three that's songs what we, that's what we do sometimes yeah so yeah. it's like i you know i i don't i don't like the last time i've had like a contract for a whole record of like 11 yeah. songs is like so funny now to me like oh i don't know maybe with my quebec bands i still do that there's some like french canadian bands that are still well they still in... they still got the those big quebec grants for the do the fucking full albums quebec man. grants and and people still buy records yeah you know and, like, yeah uh, that's true and uh and 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 uh you know i don't really miss it all that much like uh I, i'm not like i don't I, I don't wish that we can go back to the time of an album. Uh, well, albums, so like, well, that's another. You see, all you do is say really healthy things, which in, <laughs> in, in this case, it's like it'd be fucked to sit there and be like, why can't we go back to the old days? You know, and why can't things be like this? It's like things I are try, the, they're the things way, are they, the way are. they are. Things are the I, way I, they I, are. I, fucking adapt or die. That's, when I moved to New York, I had tons of the older guys that I would meet here that had been living here for a while. And they were like, oh, the old New York was cool. You know, and I moved here in like 96. And they were like, <laughs> and they were like, now it's all like, you know, gentrified and shit like that. And I would be like, all right, whatever. And then and then I, I think it's perfectly cool the way it is, you know. And then when this neighborhood started to be nice, I'd be like. They'd be like, oh, Williamsburg used to be way cooler. I'd be like, I really don't mind the fact that I could go to Gimme Coffee and grab an amazing coffee now. Yeah. You know, and, and it's like, not next to a fucking garbage can on fire. I also don't mind that my wife is able to get on the subway at three o'clock in the morning and not feel like she's threatened. You know, like yeah. there's 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 things that just change and they change and they are the way they are. My my wife is a perfect example of someone who never liked albums. And when I first met her, I would be like, 
well, this is a deal breaker. I can't go out with you, you know, but like, you know, she, she's just like, why an album? Who wants to listen to a whole more than three songs of the same artist, you know, like, and like, it's, it was weird to me when I first met her, but like, I started to understand where she was coming from. She's just like the average music listener, the average American music listener. And I, I got kind of got into like, not that idea because I still, I, I listen to playlists and stuff, you know, but uh, I, I, I still enjoy a record. I got to have a record player and I, I still have vinyl and I listen to an album, you know, but it is, it, I, I don't like bemoan the, the fact that no. it's changed. And, like, and honestly, it sounds like you guys are made for each other because you're both, <laughs> you're both fucking ahead of the curve. It sounds like you're, you know, what's coming before it comes, but it, it's, yeah. <laughs> sometimes it's hard to know that that's what's happening. You just know, yeah. you just know. So, um, tell me we're, we're, we're going on, uh, we're going on a bit of the, uh, a bit long here. So why don't you just mm. tell me, fill me in on, um, fill me in on what you're up to right now, you know, being locked down and everything. I know you got projects on the go. What are you working on? Well, I got really lucky. And, uh, just before all this, all this craziness hit, uh, I had three albums that I was like hired to mix. So, uh i just finished producing the the new sam roberts record awesome uh so we were literally i was literally in montreal recording that when the covid thing hit and i came back home and now i'm mixing that uh mixing a new white horse record um uh, what else am i doing uh so just like keeping busy, busy like doing what yeah. you do yeah well you're so, i mean right, right now people are people are asking me to mix stuff. Obviously there's no production going on. Everything that I had uh, projected to produce has all been postponed till uh, to a later day. Who knows when, but uh, I have a feeling a lot of, a lot of bands and artists and singers are, and singer songwriters are writing right now. Yeah. And, and I think like when it's going to be fine to be back in the studio with people, there's going to be a lot of people going like, I'm dying to get into the studio. Yeah. You know, I got, I got so many ideas, you know? Awesome. So. Well, I, I hope I hope to be one of those people with you one day again because be that amazing, was a lot man. of fun. And uh, thanks for coming on the show, man. So much great advice for young musicians and just so much good information in general for human Absolutely. beings. I'd so. love to do it, do it anytime. Man. Well, do you know what? Again. We're going to do it again for sure um, because this uh, was really too short. It was too fast. I know it's just, it's the way it goes. <laughs> and I've got like I've got at least like four or five questions I didn't get to. But anytime we next go time. on, mo- yeah, we, we will we will definitely have you on again. And uh, yeah, thanks again for coming. And uh, yeah, be well. And thanks. and I'll talk thanks to you. I'll talk to you as soon as I can. Yeah. Peace. See you later, buddy. That was Gus Van Gogh. What an awesome dude. Jesus Christ. I could have, I had, I did. I had like four or five more questions there for him and I, w- I would have loved to get into them. But once we hit the, yeah, we're already past the quarter, the quarter two mark. So we're going to, uh, we're going to wrap it up there for today. Um, we're going to be going live next Tuesday at 4 p.m. with um, Terry Ryan, uh, former NHL hockey player. Steve did that interview. Um, I haven't watched it yet. I'm going to watch it with you guys when we do it. So that's going to be dropping on Tuesday. We've got Total Rift Meltdown with Marv on Instagram on Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern time. I'll be popping in there. We'll be playing guitar. It'll be a lot of fun. Thanks for tuning in to every, uh, to, to, to all these streams. It's super awesome. Um, I'm going to play another track from, uh, from my new uh, side project, Bear Taker, here as we head out. Um, we'll see you next Tuesday for Quarantine Hangs episode 12. Thank you. Yeah.